نحمده و نسلی علی رسوله الكریم اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری و احلل اقدتم من لسانی یفقه قولی و جعن لی وزیر من احلی اللہم فکہنا فی الدین اعوذ باللہ ان اکون من الجاہلین رب زدنی علما اللہم الہمنا رشدا و عیسنا من شرور انفسنا اللہم ارنا الحق حقا و رزقنا اتباعا اللہم ارنا الباطل باطلا و رزقنا اجتنابا آمین سم آمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ سورة النساء ورس 77 Today I will continue my discussion from the last part of verse 77 Allah says قُلْ مَتَاعُ الدُّنْيَا قَلِيلٌ وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لِمَنِ اتَّقَى وَلَا تُظْلَمُونَ فَتِيلًا قُلْ Say, Tell, Declare announce let the people know what mataw dunya qalilun wal akhiratu khair that hereafter is better for he who who fears allah the enjoyment of the world is little and hereafter is better allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling all of us that all the worldly enjoyments, all the worldly wealth, the riches are much, much inferior and the hereafter is much better as compared to that. Allah says in Surah Hadid, verse 57, Allah says that the life of the world is what? Mata'ul ghurur, a matter of illusion. And that is why Allah keeps on telling and talking about the life of a hereafter in Quran. And then Allah in Surah Al-A'la mentions the preferences of his bondsmen as بَلْ تُقْثِرُونَ الْحَيَاتِ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْكَى but the actual condition is what? That you, you all grantsmen, you prefer the life of the world, although hereafter is better and it is eternal. The teachings of Quran, the teachings of Hadith and Sunnah actually want that the cry of the heart and the soul should be, Allahumma la aisha illa aisha al-akhira. O Allah, there is no joy other than the joy of hereafter. How important, how important hereafter is as compared to the material world. Hazrat Mustarud bin Shadad ta'ala anhu reports in Muslim that Prophet wasallam said, he explained giving an example. He said, by Allah, the likeness of this world as compared to the hereafter is, is that someone of you took out his finger after dipping it in water and then saw how much of water it had brought with itself. So Allah subhanahu wa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is explaining the importance of the material world as compared to the world or the life hereafter. The water sticking to the finger after being dipped in water is what the life of the world is as compared to the water of the seas or the oceans, the fathoms and fathoms of the depth of water of the ocean. What comparison does it have with the water which is sticking to the, to the finger after it's dipped in water? Hazrat Jabir and who reports in Muslim that Prophet was walking on a roadside that he passed by a dead young goat whose ear had been cut off and he 
he talked to the companions and he asked that will anyone of you would like to buy this dead kid for a dirham and the companions obviously said that they would not want to do that and then prophet salam said i swear in the name of allah that in his side in allah's side this world is as worthless and as useless as the dead kid is in your sight so this is exactly what the worldly life is in the sight of allah hasa sahal bin saad saadi radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports in musnad ahmad tirmizi and ibn maja that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that had this world been to allah equivalent to the wing of a mosquito he would have he wouldn't have given a sip of water to the infidels or to the disbelievers actually what prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sallallahu alaihi wasallam is trying to explain in this hadith is that the fact is that this world is altogether vain and valueless valueless in the sight of allah it is totally valueless and worthless in the sight of allah that is the reason why the unbelievers and the deniers of allah are getting in this world because in the sight of allah this world is actually of no importance that is why allah is providing and giving provisions to the unbelievers and to the deniers and if it it was not so and if allah did not consider hereafter so important in hereafter which is of real worth and importance in the judgment of allah not even as much as a drop of fresh water will be given to the disbelievers or the deniers of allah and the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam so the worldly life in the sight of allah is even less important and insignificant than the wings of a mosquito how how unimportant this life is hazrat abu huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala who reports in muslim the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the world is the prison house of a believer and the paradise of the non believers so for a believer believer this worldly life is like a prisoner's life why is it so because you know a prisoner's life is that he is not free in whatever he does he cannot carry out what other he just has to carry out what other people command he eats and he drinks what he what is given to him he sits and he stands where and when he is asked to he has no will of his own so that is exactly what a believer is in this life and another point why the world is considered as a prison house for the believer is that a prisoner does not feel attached to the prison at all never would he consider it as his home he will always be eager to get out of it but in contrast to that a believer in paradise will have no restrictions there will be no restrictions he'll be free to do as they please and all their wishes will be fulfilled and moreover no no dweller of jannah will want to leave the jannah and no dweller of jannah will get tired of living in it and be weary of the comforts of it so that is why prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has likened the world this worldly life as a prison for the believer and as a paradise for the non believers how important the hereafter is as compared to this worldly life this life is short this life is short the hereafter is eternal this is temporary that is permanent this is inferior and that is superior i just narrated a hadith a few days back where it was reported in bukhari that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave it was a very lengthy hadith and i will be just summing up the whole message the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam explained that a person who was who was a blessed person in this world and who had who had who had so many blessings and bounties of allah and he had like no tensions and no nothing to upset or distress him and he was like one of the happiest and the blessed 
people in the world and on the day of judgment if he was if he was to be given just one tip in one in one pool of the fires of hell and then he would be asked do you know of any comfort do you know of any liars he would say no by allah i've never experienced any comfort and any enjoyment in my life and then prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam explained that there would be a person who would be a deprived person who would be deprived in the in this worldly life and he had he was deprived of all the bounties and blessings of allah and he he had spent his life in all forms of distresses but then when he would be on the day of judgment be given just a one tip in one pool of jannah and be asked were you ever distressed do you know of any miseries he would say by allah i've never been distressed i know of no distresses and i know of no miseries so this is what the eternal reward and what the eternal punishments are going to be about the bounties of this world as compared to the bounties of jannah the golds the silver and the riches of this world as compared to the gold and silver and the riches of jannah where the palaces one brick of gold and the other brick of silver studded with pearls and rubies and emeralds and the worries and the tensions of this world and the miseries and distresses and the agonies of this world comparing to the distresses and the agonies and the torments of hell and plus the hereafter is going to be eternal we we learn we learn what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that on the day of judgment death will be death will be summoned in the form of a white ram and then it will be slain in front of the people of paradise and the people of hell and then the people of hell will be told that now death will not be attended on you and the people of paradise will be told by the angels by the angels of paradise the people of the paradise will be told that now you will always be young and youthful you'll never get old you'll always be healthy and strong and never you will get sick and weak you'll all you'll always be staying here and you will never be asked to leave and you will always live and you never will die so these are these are the blessings and the bounties of hereafter as compared to the world Hazrat Abu Musa Ashri radiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports in Musnad Ahmad that Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says whoever loves the world shall damage his hereafter we need to prefer we need to make hereafter as our preference i repeat again prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said whoever loves the world loves the world meaning that he loves he desires Whoever loves the world shall damage his hereafter and whoever loves his hereafter shall damage his world thus that's what thus once you are choosing between the world and hereafter you should prefer what is lasting to what is transitory so remember as allah says wal akhiratu khairun wa atqa wal akhiratu khairun wa atqa is what that when a person will make the world as the exclusive aim of his life then he will live for it his endeavors will all be directed towards the material aims and the interests of the world and so his hereafter will get into the background he will not take care about it and this will lead to the loss of the hereafter but if a person will set his heart to the hereafter he will strive for it for the best of his ability and so his worldly interests are bound to suffer in outcome so the basic object of our desires has to be the eternal hereafter 
Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Thurimzi and Ibn Majah that Prophet said, the world is accused and what it contains is accused except remembrance of Allah and what he likes and the teachers and the taught. So the world actually is something which makes a man forget Allah and his way after. And then the person who just is remembering the world or bothered about the world, he becomes so much absorbed and involved in this world that he just forgives, forgets about Allah and he just forgets about his hereafter. And once a person is just concerned about the world, then he will not be able to stop himself from sinning. Hazrat Anas ta'ala and who reports that the Prophet Sallallahu said, Is there anyone who walks on water and his feet do not get wet? Prophet Sallallahu when he asked, the companion says, It cannot be. And then Prophet Sallallahu said, In the same way, the worldly-minded person cannot remain free from sin. You know, when a person is, is really interested and intent on the worldly players and the worldly gains, then he will not be able to remain away or safe from sins. But when the ultimate aim of a bondsman is seeking the player of Allah to save ourselves from his wrath, to save ourselves from the hell or to enter into Jannah, then it will not be difficult for him to keep away from the sinful acts, even if he is in the worldly pursuits. And then Hazrat Qatada bin Nu'man ta'ala who reports in Musa Ahmad and Turimzi that Prophet said, when Allah loves anyone, Allahumma ja'alna minhum, Allah make us one of them. Allahumma inni as'aluka hubbaka wa hubba man yuhibbuka wa amala allazi yuballighuni hubbaka. When Allah loves anyone, he makes him avoid the world. That is why Prophet Sallallahu kept on advising and counseling his companions to stay away from the world. Hazrat Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who reports, he reports in Bukhari, that Prophet held me by my shoulders. He was grasping my shoulders with both his hands and he, and he told me, he talked to me, he said, live in this world as if you were a stranger. Live in this world as if you were a stranger or a traveler. This was the advice of Prophet to his, to his brother-in-law. Why live as a traveler? You know what? The traveler actually does not set his heart to the journey. No traveler enjoys the journey and no traveler would want his travel or journey to continue endlessly. Everybody would want the journey to end smoothly and comfortably and every, every person traveling actually desires and longs to reach his actual destination safely and comfortably. We are the travelers on the path of Jannah. Allahumma ihtina sirat al mustaqim And our destination, inshallah, is Jannah. We are not going to set our heart to this world. We are not going to enjoy living in this world. And we are not going to desire this life to continue endlessly. We are going to focus on the destination of Jannah. And we are going to desire to reach safely and comfortably to Jannah. And then, you know, the traveler takes with him all the provisions which are necessary for traveling and nothing beyond that. And so a true believer should also not imagine the world to be a real abode as if we're going to live here forever. This is purely temporarily and prepare for the, for the hereafter. 
Prophet ﷺ has been reported by Hazrat Amr ibn Lawf in Bukhari and Muslim the Prophet ﷺ said this world is something which Prophet ﷺ feared of for the Ummah. Prophet ﷺ said it is not poverty that I fear for you but what I really fear for you is that the world will be spread for you that is the riches and the wealth of the world will be spread for you as it had been spread for those who came before you so that you may start desiring it like they desired it and then it may destroy you as it destroyed them and then Hazrat Qab bin Ayaz ta'ala, who reports in Tirmizi that Prophet said that for every community there is a trial and the trial of my followers or my community is wealth the riches and wealth of this world of this life are actually the trial of this life and that is what we need to stop getting involved in the lust of money Hazrat Qab bin Malik radiyallahu ta'ala who reports in Tirmizi that Prophet said no two hungry wolves let loose in a flock of goats can devour the goats so easily as the greed of a man for wealth and fame does his faith so this is the desire the lust of wealth the desire for fame of this wealth Hazrat Abu Huraira radiyallahu ta'ala who reports in Bukhari and Muslim that Prophet sallallahu said the heart of an old man always remains young in two respects love of this world and the distant future the desire to be wealthy the desire to be famous the desire to be popular the desire to be known the desire to be reputed well to, to be talked well of and the desire to own riches and wealth and gold and silver in this world and the condition is as Hazrat Abdullah bin Abbas radiyallahu ta'ala who reports in Bukhari and Muslim that even if the son of Adam possesses two fields of gold even if the son of Adam would possess two fields or two valleys of gold, would he desire for the third? O oh, son of Adam, only the soil, only the dust of the grave will fill your belly. So this is the desire and this is the greed of this world. That is why Prophet says, and continuously asks us not to be greedy, not to be desirous, not to be just connected and not to be just loving this world. Hazrat Anas radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Tirmizi and Muslim Ahmad that Prophet said, a person whose chief aim, the person whose chief aim, ambition, target or goal in life will be seeking of hereafter through his effort and exertion, Allah will grant him contentment. So you see, when our target becomes hereafter, Allah will grant us contentment and tranquility and free from the want and the distresses of the world. Allah will grant him contentment to his heart and remove his distresses and the world. The world will come to him humbled by itself. But a person, but a person whose chief aim and ambition will be seeking of this world through his efforts or exertion, then Allah will produce the marks of want in the middle of his forehead and on his face and make his condition miserable. Allah will make the condition of the person whose main aim is the world. Allah says, Prophet says, Allah will make his condition miserable. And he, despite working for the world and despite seeking for the world and staying miserable for the things he's deprived in the world, he will get only that much of the world as has been ordained for him beforehand. As was written in his fate, as was destined for him, as was ordained for him previously. So that is why we need to target we need to make our aim, we need to make our goals, we need to set our ambitions for the hereafter.
But despite all that, there are people who are always going after and running after the wealth and the riches of the world. Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala who reports in Muslim the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, the bondsman says, my property, my property, my treasures, my property. They keep on talking about their property. They keep on worrying about their property. They're just worried and they're just obsessed about their bank statements and their banks, bank balances. The bondman says, my property, my property, though in the whole of the worldly possession, what belongs actually to him is, number one, what he ate and he consumed. He finished we, what he just ate up and he just finished, he consumed. Number two, what he wore and he made old. And third, he made charity in the way of Allah and made provisions for his hereafter. So what we spent out of our money, out of our time, out of our capabilities, our potentials, is what we are making provision for our hereafter. Hazrat Mahmoud bin Labid radiallahu ta'ala and who reposts in Musnad Ahmad that Prophet said there are two things a man dislikes. There are two things which a man dislikes and actually why Prophet was wanting to explain that is that these are the two things which are actually good for him. There are two things a man dislikes. One is death though death is better for the believer than mischief. And the other is poverty, having few positions and blessings and bounties, though few positions involve a shorter and a lighter reckoning of the hereafter. Person who will be poor, who will have lesser possessions, will obviously have a shorter accountability and an easier accountability. Allahumma hasibna hasabi yasira. Allahumma hasibna hasab yasira. So that is why the anxiety of hereafter plays the main and the pivot and the vital role in improvement of our morals, of the spiritual quality of our life, and the evolution of the stages of salvation. Prophet said. Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Bukhari that Prophet said he warned by him who has my life in his hand if you knew what I know if you knew what I know know or thought the torments of hereafter the anger of the Lord the terrible events of the last day the torments of the hell you would laugh blessed and you would weep more and you know what? People of hellfire would cry and they would weep that their tears would flow down, would trickle down their cheeks, would make, would make streaks, would make marks on their faces because of the tears rolling down. And Allah has encouraged us, Allah has encouraged us to spend our life, our property, Everything for for trading and for bartering with hair light hereafter. Allah says in Surah Toba, verse 111, Inna Allah hashtara min al mu'minina anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahum al jannah. Allah has traded, Allah has bartered, Allah has bought from believers their lives, their wealth, and in turn has given them what? Promised them what? Bi anna lahum al jannah, the gardens of the paradise. That is why when Prophet Sallallahu was asked, he said what? Hazrat Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who reports, the Prophet Sallallahu was asked, O Messenger of Allah, tell us who is the wisest and who is the most far-sighted of men? The wisest and the far-sighted of men. Allah, make us one of them. But we're not just, not just going to pray. Let's see what Prophet actually said. The Prophet replied, He who remembers death, he who remembers death much and makes the greatest efforts for its preparation. They alone are the wise and prudent who are like that. 
they earn the respect of the world as well as the glory in hereafter. So wise and far-sighted are those who remember death and make the greatest preparation for the life after death. And what will they get? These wise and prudent and far-sighted people have been promised the respect and the honor of the world and the glory of hereafter. Allah make us one of those wise and wise and far-sighted people. Allah bless us with the respect of the world and the glory of hereafter. Allah save us from the torments of hereafter and bless us with the bounties of hereafter. Hazrat Shaddad bin Aus radiyallahu ta'ala who reports in Tirmizi and Ibn Majah that Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the wise and the strong the wise and the strong is the one who keeps his inordinate desires under control. He keeps his inordinate desires under control and then strives for the life after death. The foolish, the foolish and the weak is the one who subordinates himself to his worldly players and then in return hopes the best from Allah Azza wa Jal. Hazrat Utaiba bin Abid radiyallahu ta'ala who reports in Mustad Ahmad the Prophet sallallahu has informed us all that if a person lies continually in prostration from the day of his birth to the day of his death continue, continuously lies in prostration from the time from the day he was born to the day of his death seeking the pleasure of Allah then on the day of judgment he will consider his deed as worthless so this is how important the life of hereafter is as compared to the life of this world the enjoyment the players the contentment the happinesses the wealth the rejoicing of this world. Allah help us set our preferences and priorities in the correct form. Make, let help us all to make the hereafter our primary priority, our first preference, our ultimate goal, our ambition, our aim, our targets of life. And then Allah says, I read again the words, the enjoyment of the words of the world is little and hereafter is better for the people. This hereafter will be better for whom? Wal akhiratu khayrul liman ittaqa. The hereafter is better for the person who fears Allah. The hereafter which is important, the hereafter which is permanent, which is eternal, which is superior, will be better for the person who fears Allah. Fear of Allah. Taqwa. Taqwa is the fear of Allah. Piety, piousness of the bondsman is taqwa. What do we mean and what do we comprehend when we talk about piety, piousness or the fear of Allah? The fear of Allah is what and how is it going to be rewarded? Allah says in Surah Rahman, وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّتَان This is what the fear of Allah is means and this verse actually tells what the fear of Allah will be rewarded with. I repeat and recite again for the person who fears standing in front of Allah, the person who, who fears standing in the coat of Allah on the day of judgment, he will be rewarded with two gardens in Jannah. Standing in front of Allah. Standing in front 
In the coach of Allah, the fear of that is actually taqwa. And why standing, being asked, being questioned, having, having accountability, standing there will be like what? Allah will say, You've come, oh my bondsman, you've come all by yourself. You've come all alone, all by yourself. The way I created you, the way you came to the world when you were birth, when you were given birth to, when you were born, all by ourselves, alone, alone in front in the coat of Allah. And Allah on his throne with no with no curtain in between, with no interpreter, just the bondsman, just the person in Allah. And Prophet says that nobody Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and who reposed in Bukhari that Prophet said that nobody on the day of judgment will be able to move an inch. Nobody will be able to budge an inch until and unless he answers three questions. <coughs> he answers he answers five questions. The five questions are how did you spend your youth? How did you spend your youth when you were young? You had all the strength, the power, the memory, the free time, the health, the support of your parents, your siblings, and all the time in the world and all the memory and strength and power in the world. How did you spend your youth? What did you see? What did you hear? What did you wear? How did you talk and how did you walk? How did you make fun of people? How did you relate with the opposite sex? When you had all the bounties in the world and you went all the time in the world, how did you spend your youth? That would be the first question of Allah. Then, okay, fine. In youth, in youth you... you you can't, there were times when you could not control your desires, you could not resist the temptations of the world. Then you did not even have the proper knowledge, you lacked the knowledge of Quran and Hadiths. You did not even have the experience of the world. You did not even you had not even gained the experiences of the life. Okay, fine. Then the second question would be how did you spend the rest of your life? Some were given 80, some were given 90, some allotted 95 years in the world. How did you spend the rest of your life? Did you, did you repent? Did you convince, did you convince, confess your sins? Did you cry to seek forgiveness? To err was human, but did you try, did you try to correct yourself? The third question, how did you earn? How did you earn your wealth, your riches, your earnings? Were they lawful? Were they halal? Did you refrain from unlawful forbidden, forbidden earnings? The fourth question, how did you spend your lawful earnings? How did you spend your riches, your wealth, your gold, your money? Showing off? Boasting off, wastefully, miserly, against or according to the limits of Allah, on forbidden things. How did you spend your money would be the first, fourth question. And the fifth, the last but not the least would be the knowledge. The knowledge you were given, you were blessed with. How much? Did you act according to it? What you learned, what you were taught, what you read, what you listened, what you knew about the, 
about the commandments of Quran, about the teachings, what the Prophet ﷺ taught and brought, when you got to know all that, how much did you act upon them? Allahumma anfa'na bima allamtana wa allimna ma yanfa'una wa sidna ilma. Rabbi sidna ilma. Allahumma faqihna fi al-deen. Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafiyan, rizqan tuayyiban wa amalan mutakabbala. So this is the fear, the fear to answer these questions and the fear not being able to budge an inch before answering these questions. How we've spent our youth, how are we spending our life, how are we earning, how are we spending and how are we acting about our deeds, about our sins. The fear of Allah is this. The fear of Allah is what? The fear of his accountability, the fear of his punishments, the fear of his wrath, the fear of his hell, the fear of his hellfire, the fear of being deprived of Jannah, the fear of the displayer of Allah. This is actually piety. This is actually fear of Allah and this is what a muttaqi fears of. Allah here is saying the fear of Allah is better for them. Yes, piety, fear of Allah, taqwa is, is better for all of us. Allah says, Allah announces, Allah promises, in Allah yuhibbul muttaqeen. There is absolutely no doubt, for sure, verily, Allah will love the pious. Allah will love those who have piety and those who fear Allah. They will be the beloved people of Allah who are the pious and who fear Allah. Then Allah says, Inna Allah ma'al muttaqeen. Verily, there's no doubt that Allah will be with all the people who fear Allah. Allah will be with them for help, for support, for sustenance, for protection, for guidance, for his player, for his bounties. Allah will be with them. Then Allah promises in Quran, Inna al-muttaqeena mafaza. There is absolutely no doubt. Rest for a sure. There is absolutely no doubt that all the muttaqeen are, the, are going to be successful. All the God-fearing, all the pious and all of those who have piety of Allah, they are going to be successful where? Here and hereafter. Then Allah says, Wal-aqibatul muttaqeen. Then Allah says in Surah, in Surah, Tulbakara, immediately starting verses of Surah Tulbakara, Allah says, This Quran is what? La Raiba fi Hudalil Muttaqeen. There is absolutely no doubt about this. Don't doubt in this Quran. Don't doubt in this holy book of Allah. And if you don't doubt in this, and if you are pious, and if you are God fearing, then this book will be a source of guidance to all, not. This book of guidance, this Quran will be a source of guidance only and only to those who are God-fearing. We can be Allah's beloved if we are God-fearing. We will, we will have the support of Allah and Allah will be with us if we are God-fearing. We will be of the successful people. And we will, we will be guided to the straight path if we are God-fearing. Allah says in Surah Al Imran, Sari wila makfirati mir rabbikum in jannatin, arzu has sama wati wal az, raid that lil muttakeen. Proceed, proceed, go fast towards the forgiveness of Allah and toward his jannah, which is how wide? It is as wide, it is as broad as the earth and as the heavens. And it has been specifically and specially entirely prepared for whom? It has been prepared in advance. 
Nuzulum me Rabbil Alameen. Nuzulum is a hospitality which is prepared by the host before the guest comes. So Jannah has been prepared for the Muttaqeen before they will, they, they will enter the Jannah. So this is Taqwa. And this is what Allah promises for all the Muttaqeen. Where does Taqwa reside in our body? In Bukhari, it is reported that Prophet was asked, where is Taqwa? And he said, he was pointing, the narrator said that he was pointing towards his heart. <coughs> The narrator says that he was pointing towards his heart and he was saying taqwa ha huna taqwa ha huna taqwa ha huna the taqwa is in the heart the taqwa is in the heart the taqwa is in the heart of the believer and prophet sallallahu has warned us as reported in bukhari that there is a part of the body there's an organ in the body that if this stays well and this stays in a good state and the whole body stays well and the whole body is in a good state in a state of virtue but if this organ and part of the body goes bad it goes evil it becomes wretched the whole body becomes wretched the whole body becomes evil the whole all the parts of the body go and start committing evil deeds i warn you that part of the body is the heart it is the soul Remember, fear of Allah and piety is a state of mind. It is a condition of the heart. And that is why Allah orders. Allah orders in Surah Al-Imran, Ya yuhallazina amanu taqullaha haqqa tuqatihi. Fear Allah as it is the right of Allah to be feared from him. <coughs> Fear Allah, this is an order of Allah. Fear Allah the way it is the right of Allah to be feared for him. What is the right of taqwa? That the fear of Allah be above all forms of worldly fears. The fear of Allah be more than and on top of all the fears of the world. It means what? Let's all ask ourselves the few questions to to see and to analyze whether we fear Allah like Hakka Tukatihi. The fear of displeasing, the flair of the displayer of Allah should be more and it should exceed the fear of that our children, our spouse, or our family would would be unhappy, or they would not be pleased. The fear of being questioned, the fear of being questioned, or being interrogated by our 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 friends, that is what we generally call as the peer pressure. What? What will I answer when my friends ask me that why have I started covering my face? Why have I started covering my face with a veil? How will I answer my friends? What answer will I have to my society or to my clan or to my family or to my tribe when I, when I just let my daughter go after marriage without a dowry, how will I answer the questions of the society? The fear of the questions of the people around us becomes more than the fears of the accountability and of the questions of Allah. The desire to please Allah should be the most than the desire to please the people around us, our relatives, our kinsmen. So this is Hakka Tukatihi. How Allah actually 
thinks this hakka tukati he is important what the bondsman is that the person who is most esteemed in the sight of Allah is the person who has taqwa in heart as Allah says as Allah says in Quran inna akramakum in the lahi atqakum inna akramakum in the lahi atqakum the best of you in the sight of Allah is one who is most pious and who is most god fearing and that is what prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has also been reported to say prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said hazrat abu zar ghafari radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports in musnad ahmad the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said you as a person enjoy no superiority over a white skinned or a black skinned man you can of course be excellent through piety and the fear of allah and similarly it is reported by hazrat maaz radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu in musnad ahmad the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that much closer and dearer to me are the bondsmen who fear allah whoever they are wherever they are so whoever a person is wherever he is to whichever clan to whichever tribe to which color to whichever creed a person belongs is not important in the eyes of allah and in the eyes and the heart of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the person who is closer who is dearer who is superior who is more honored is the person who has more piety who has more fear of allah who is more god fearing and what will be the reward of the person on the day of judgment how a god fearing will be will get the reward of salvation from hell hazrat anas radhiyallahu ta'ala and who reports in tarmizi that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that on the day of judgment allah will command the angels of hell there will be angels who are going to be stationed at hell so allah will command the angels stationed at hell that who ever may have remembered him at any time remembered who allah at any time or feared allah on any occasion should be taken out of hell allahumma ja'alna minhum allahumma ja'alna minhum oh allah make us one of them allahumma ajirna min an-nar oh allah save us all from the torments of hell fire and how much allah likes the fear of allah and crying out of the fear of allah in bukhari is a hadith narrates the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that the two drops which allah likes the most the first is the drop of blood of a martyr at the time of martyrdom and second is the drop of tear from the eyes of a believer when he cries for the fear of allah and the two eyes which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes and loves the most and honors the most are number 1 is the eye which i mentioned yesterday also the eye which keeps on the watch and the look out to protect the boundaries of an islamic state and the second eye is the eye of believer who cries due to the fear of allah who clear who who cries who cries out to the fear of allah of the sins which he has committed which might make him might make him be one of the people of hell fire and how important these tears are Hazrat Abdullah bin Mas'ud radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports in Ibn Majah the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the tears that fall from the eyes of a true believer out to the fear of Allah and they roll down his face however little they are however little they are even if they are 
as the size of the head of a fly, they shall prevent the fire of the hell touching the face. The Hadith promises that the fire of the hell has been forbidden on the face which has been touched by the tears flowing due to the fear of Allah. How much Allah loves the bondsmen who fear Him, who cry out to the fear of Allah. Prophet used to very frequently ask and supplicate these words. Allahumma hasibna khisa bi yaseera. He used to supplicate for an easy accountability. And one day, Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and who and her who used to very really frequently listen to these words, one day she asked Prophet Sallallahu and she asked Prophet Sallallahu what do you mean by easy accountability in Hisab and Yasirwa? Prophet Sallallahu said, Aisha, it means that there is no accountability, that the person is not interrogated. And then Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and her asked, O Messenger of Allah, Will there be people who will enter Jannah without any accountability? Are there going to be certain lucky people? Are there going to be certain lucky people who are going to enter Jannah without any accountability? Prophet ﷺ said, Yes, O Aisha, the people who enter the Jannah without any accountability will be the people who, when they are all by themselves, in their solitude, when they are all by themselves, alone, and they remember their sins, and they cry out of the fear of Allah, these will be the people who will be allowed to, or who will be permitted to enter Jannah without any accountability. And then Prophet Sallallahu has been reported in Bukhari by Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu that Prophet Sallallahu said <coughs> talking about the day of resurrection he said that the sun with all of its, its intensities will be as close to the distance of an arrow or a spear to the fields of resurrection and people according to their deeds will be sweating and they will be drenched in their sweat and there will be no shade except the shade of throne of Allah Azza wa Jal and then seven lucky people will be permitted and allowed to enter the shade of the throne of Allah on the day of resurrection these seven people will be number one a just ruler the second a person who worshipped Allah even even in his youth when he was young he was youthful he resisted all the temptations of sleep and worldly activities and he worshipped Allah this was also out of fear of Allah the third is a person whose heart whose desires are just linked and connected and bonded with the mosque, with the congregational prayers and with Salah. And the fourth will be a young person, a young man, whom a beautiful, young, wealthy woman gave an invitation of immorality or adultery. And he just refused by saying that I fear Allah. This was what? The fear of Allah, the piety which led him to chastity and modesty. This was the fear of Allah which helped him maintain his modesty, his chastity and to refrain from immorality and adultery. And then the fifth would be the people who love each other for the sake of Allah. They meet for the sake of Allah and they depart and they separate each other from the sake of love of Allah. The sixth will be the person who will spend charity in the way of Allah 
and would do so in such a hidden and a concealed manner that if he spends with his right hand the left hand would not get to know about it no show off no boasting off no exhibition or demonstration of his charity and then the seventh the last but not the least person would be the person who when he remembers his sins who would remember his negligences his disobediences would cry out of the fear of allah then this would be the person who would be permitted in the throne of allah allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha the fear of allah is going to be a cause a source of being pardoned by allah there is a very interesting and very promising narration by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam hazrat abu huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports in bukhari and muslim that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that there was a person who had who had actually spent his life in all forms of transgression and disobedience and sins this person did a great injustice to himself and when the hour of his death drew near he was seized with the fear of allah because all of his neglect negligences in the life and because of all the even doings in his life and then when before the time of his death he called his sons and he instructed his sons that after his death they should burn his body to ashes and scatter some of the ashes on land and some in water in the rivers so when he died his sons obeyed what he had asked them to do and they burned his dead body down to ashes and they actually uh blew some of the ashes in the air and then put some of the ashes in the in a river and by allah what happened then that immediately by the order of allah there was a command of allah the kalamai kun of allah that remains of his dead body they were all gathered from the land and from water and he was resurrected and he was brought back to life and then allah azza wa jalla asked him why did you do that that is why did you instruct your children to do that and what did he answer what did did this person who had spent his life in disobedience in sins in transgression committing all forms of sin doing all forms of evil do deeds living leading all his life in all forms of negligence and disobedience this person said oh my allah i did this only because i feared you i couldn't face you how could i face you with spending all these forms of life this fear of allah prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said allah pardoned him and he was made to enter into jannah so this is the merit this is the excellence of the feeling of fear of allah allahumma aati nafsi taqwa ha allahumma aati nafsi taqwa ha the companions the companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam feared allah like anything The mother of believers at the Taisha was the Allah who Taala and Ha used to say, "I wish I was a tiny bird." For the fear of accountability, were these words said? Has the Abu Bakr, has the Abu Bakr Siddiq, was the Allah who Taala and who used to say, "I wish, I wish I was the blade of a grass, which had just dried and the winds had blown it away." Hazrat Usman radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu he used to cry cry for the fear of hell for the fear of the day of resurrection for the fear of the life higher after for the fear of Allah 
that his beard become used to become wet hasad abu zarghafari radiyallahu ta'ala anhu one of the sabiqun he used to say i wish i was a tree which was just cut down and which was just finished off hasad abu huraira radiyallahu ta'ala anhu who has reported who has narrated the greatest number of ahadith his time of death he was crying and people asked are you crying for the shock of leaving this world he said no i'm crying because of the realization that my that the journey is long and the provisions are very little allahu akbar allahu akbar hasan abu huraira is saying that his provisions for the journey for the long journey were very little what provisions have we gathered my sisters my daughters he said the journey this was the journey of hereafter which for which he was crying the journey is long and the provisions are little and he said i have reached a point ahead of which is either hell or paradise and i know i do not know which will be my abode hazrat abu huraira didn't know what will be his abode how do we know how are we so content how are we so involved in this world how are we not fearing allah how are we not preparing for hereafter hasat umar radiyallahu ta'ala and who used to cry he used to cry the whole night he used to cry out of the fear of hereafter out of the fear of the long journey out of the fear of his provisions being less he used to cry and because of the continual crying the continual flowing of tears there were marks there were there were streaks on his face and he used to say i wish my mother my mother never gave birth to me the taqwa of umar radiyallahu ta'ala and who so many occasions in his life we see his taqwa when he became the caliph he used to cry at the nights he used to cry through the night and he used to cry for the fear of accountability and he used to say oh umar oh umar that even if a dog dies out of hunger or thirst on the bank of tigris then you will be held accountable on the day of judgment it was this fear of allah it was this fear of accountability which did not let him sleep at night he being the caliph he used to disguise himself and he used to go about in the streets of the cities one night he heard some children cry he knocked at the door a lady came out he asked him why are the children crying the lady said we are poor we don't have any provisions we don't have any food to eat today and the children are hungry and that is why they're crying and then she said what she said may umar be ill fated obviously she had not recognized the caliph may umar be ill fated he does not help us he does not support us he does not provide provisions for us he immediately tried to cover himself justify himself and he said oh sister he might not be aware of your conditions she immediately said may umar be ill fated then why doesn't he try to find out about our conditions that was enough for hazrat umar he started trembling with fear of allah he started trembling with the fear of accountability he cried all the way back to baitul mal he took out a bag of flour and he he carried it him on his shoulders and when the when the slave asked and requested him to let me carry all this weight he said oh my brother you will share my weight you will share my load in this world who will share my load here after he came back to the lady he helped her prepare the meal he fed the children 
and then only could he sleep over the night. How are we sleeping through the night, days in and days out? With so many people in our neighborhood, with so many children in our neighborhood, knowing that on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be asking his bondsmen, I was hungry, why didn't you feed me? And the bondsman will say, Oh Allah, you are the sustainer, you are the provider. How could we feed you? And Allah Azza wa Jal will say, Such and such bondsman of mine was hungry, begged you for food, asked you for food out of hunger, and you did not provide. You did not feed him in hunger. Had you fed him, you would have found him with me. You would have found me with him. What are we doing? What are we standing? What are we bothered about? We're just bothered about our eat as much you, as you can. We are just worrying about what we need to cook and what we need to eat. The latest and the changing dishes on our counters. Another occasion, Hazrat Umar who was again in the streets at night and he heard a baby crying. He knocked again. A lady came out. He asked, why is the baby crying? And the woman said that the caliph has announced. She again had not recognized Hazrat Umar. The caliph has announced that when a mother stops lactating or nursing her baby, then they will be provided scholarship as provision for the baby. So we are poor and we are needy and so desirous of availing this state scholarship for my baby, I have stopped nursing or lactating my baby from today and he is crying out of hunger because obviously the mother was not feeding the baby. Hazrat Umar ta'ala and who? He was shell shock. He was stunned. And he was so upset that he came back and he spent the whole night crying. What was he saying? He said, Umar, oh Umar, it was because of your faulty decision and your faulty announcement that you know not of how many, how many babies might have been deprived tonight of their due right of being nursed by their mothers. You and your announcement of this scholarship might have been the cause of depriving the babies of their right of being lactated or nursed. In the morning he got up, he made an amendment, he made an amendment to the law and he announced that from now onwards the state will be giving monetary help to all the babies from the day they were born. This was the fear of Allah. My decisions my decisions might not be a source of trouble or a source of issues to somebody. The sense of accountability to face Allah. This was the fear of Allah. And remember those who fear Allah, they love those who fear Allah. Those who are pious, they honor those who are pious. There was another night. Hazrat Umar who was again in the streets out till dawn, till the time of milking of cows and he passed by a house. The family used, they had cows and they used to sell milk and that was a source of earning for them. And he just overheard the conversation between the mother and the daughter. The mother was asking the daughter and instructing the daughter to add some water to the milk expecting that obviously they will raise more money with this adulteration. But you know what the daughter said? The daughter said, Mom, don't you know that the caliph has announced that the person who does adulteration will be strictly punished or will be severely punished? The mom said, Okay, how, how do you know? The caliph doesn't know what we are doing and the caliph is not seeing or hearing us. Okay, go ahead, do what I'm telling you to. The daughter said, Mom, 
the caliph is not seeing the caliph is not hearing the caliph doesn't know but the caliph's allah is all knowing is all seeing is all hearing he knows so you see this is piety and this is taqwa and this is the fear of allah that a person is sensitive the person realizes that allah is seeing allah is hearing and allah is all knowing he knows what i am doing he knows what i am talking he knows what i am saying is taqwa he who is the master of the day of resurrection the day of judgment he who will be taking the accountability he knows this exactly is taqwa children are generally closer to nature and they respond faster to the calls and to the messages of islam i clearly remember that story that there was a father and a son who were going and they came across a mango tree and all the mangoes were big and ripe and yellow and they were very tempting and the father asked the son to stay behind and stand close to the stem or underneath the tree and be on the watch out and be on the lookout and then he said that okay you stand here and i will i will climb the tree and i will bring a few ripe mangoes for both of us to eat and he climbed the tree and he was at the top and he was just going to pluck a mango that the that the sun beneath the tree he started shouting out he's looking he's seeing he's seeing and he immediately came down and he looked around and he said who who is there there's nobody here nobody's seeing he said allah is looking at us allah is seeing all this so this is taqwa and you know hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala and who when he heard the talk and the conversation and what he realized the fear of god in this in this daughter of that lady he asked his slave to mark this house and to remember the house and in the morning he came and he called his sons and he asked them whether any one of them wanted to get married Hazrat Salim bin Umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu his wife had recently um, passed away and he said that I am desirous of getting married and prof and Hazrat Umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu being the caliph of such a big islamic state the caliph of such a huge islamic state sent proposal asked for the hands of whom for his son for whom for such a poor family it was not the riches it was not the social standard which was important but it was the taqwa which was important for them and you know what this lady when she was wedded with the son of hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala who she then later on became the grandmother her great grandson was umar bin abdul aziz the pious the god fearing umar bin abdul aziz whose period was the golden era of the umayyad dynasty and how he was pious and how he was god fearing in his blood vessels was the blood of hazrat umar and he was the progeny of this pious grandmother the pious umar bin abdul aziz was so god fearing that he used to work and he used to study late night and when he used to do his office work or his official work he used to use the lamp the official lamp and when his official work used to finish and he used to do his personal reading or some personal work then he used to blow off this official lamp in which the oil was at the state expenses you know he used to blow off this official lamp and then he used to light his own personal lamp this was what there was this was the fear of accountability lest he may use 
the trust of the state for his personal purposes. This was all out of the fear of Allah. He was sitting in his courtyard one day and the state guest house was very adjacent to his house. In fact, the state guest house was a neighboring house. And he was sitting in his courtyard and he saw that one of his maids was coming from the state guest house and she had a cup in her hand. He immediately inquired that what is this cup about and what is in it? And the maid said that there was, she had taken some milk from the state guest house and the milk she was taking was to let his wife take a medicine because his wife was pregnant and uh, she was having a threat of aborting the pregnancy and the medical personnel had advised her to take a medicine with a cup of milk. So since there was no milk at home, the maid to give his wife to save her pregnancy from aborting was taking the milk from the state guest house. Furious did he stop the maid, asked her to go back and return the milk. And then he said, I would prefer, I would prefer this pregnancy being aborted rather than my wife giving birth to a baby whose flesh and whose body was raised consuming the unlawful or the forbidden food or milk. This sensitivity for the lawful earning, for the trust, was because of the fear of Allah. This was the fear of Allah, of the companions, of the Tabaeen, of the Taba Tabaeen, which would definitely raise their ranks in the sight of Allah on the Day of Judgment. Now winding up, I would, I would be reciting a, a very brief supplication of the Prophet ﷺ. Try to remember the words and recite it very frequently. You can recite it in your Salah and you can recite it even otherwise. Two supplications. The briefest one, as small as like two or three words. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. O Allah, bless, bless us with your fear. Bless us with piety. And the second supplication which Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught all of us is Allahumma inni as'aluka al-huda wal-tuka wal-athafa wal-ghina Here Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught us to ask for guidance and to ask for piety and to ask for modesty and chastity and to ask for getting ourselves just worry and bother about the hereafter and to get beyond the worries of this world and just to be bothered about hereafter. I repeat, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-khuda wa-tuka wal-athafa wal-ghina. Rabbana, Rabbana la tuzay qulubana bata iz khadaytana wa khablana millatun ka rahma innaka antal wahab subhanak allahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu alayk subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al mursalin walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen ameen summa ameen tomorrow we will start from verse 78 and inshallah ta'ala ulazim i shall be talking about death and a narration of the torments and of the blessings and the bounties in the grave and uh, i will be requesting all of you as i request usually uh, i generally introduce what we are going to do tomorrow because so that we all know and what we all look forward to 
and secondly also to encourage you and to motivate you all to uh, invite others and today i would also request all of you to share all this on your profiles and to forward all these lectures not to only your friends in the country but also outside to all the people abroad inshallah so that many people outside our islamic state or outside in the non muslim world when they when they get to hear and when they get to learn the beautiful teachings of quran will they will be attracted will they be motivated and will they be encouraged to accept and to embrace this islam and remember if you forwarded it to any one of those and because of your forwarding hearing all this somebody embraced islam then that will obviously and very obviously will be a source of being pardoned be a source of salvation for you and for me and for all of us fi amanillah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh